Welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman, and I am so glad you're here. In this podcast, we engage in meaningful, deeply human conversations, using our voices to inspire connection, compassion, understanding, empathy, and wholehearted wellness. I want you to find the courage to transform yourself no matter what others tell you. Only you can give yourself permission to trust yourself, permission to take care of yourself, permission to follow your heart and desires, and build a life of love, home, and belonging. Through sharing our stories, we will help each other to heal and create the healthy, meaningful lives we richly deserve. We only need our own permission to begin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman, and I am thrilled that you are here. In today's episode, I talk with a friend of mine named Carrie Arend, who is the author of a wonderful book called Project Career Quest, Navigating the Journey to New Opportunities Waiting. And she is uh, an author, she's a speaker, she's a trainer, she's a career coach, she's a certified project management professional, and she has worked extensively throughout the United States and Canada and internationally all over Europe and Asia, delivering training and performance improvement interventions for Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, nonprofits, and small entrepreneurial companies in the best practices of project management, leadership development, team building, communications, negotiating skills, etc. For over 20 years, she has worked with individuals and organizations to increase skills and competencies and to help them meet their challenges with confidence. She's worked with more companies than I could list, and she has a, a wealth of experience that she brings to the table. Uh, she's worked she, she, in human resources. She's got a master's in project management from George Washington University. She's worked with the John Maxwell team focusing on leadership and personal growth. And our conversation today focuses mostly on the, the Myers-Briggs typology inventory, um, this is a, a personality preference um, survey, basically. It's not a test. There's no right and wrong. Um, and she does a very good job as explaining what the, the MBTI, Myers-Briggs Typology Inventory, is about and what we can get out of it, not only for job hunting and job searches, but for our interpersonal relationships and for getting to know ourselves and how amazing we are and what our gifts are and getting to know, you know, all the facets of our wonderful, quirky, phenomenal personalities. Um, Carrie is um, very articulate and has lots of Use, useful, lots of inspiring stories to uh, help elucidate uh, all the things that she's talking about. So I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoyed listening to her talk. She's she's always so great. And um, in the show notes, if you look down below, if you scroll, uh, you'll find a list. Um, you'll find links to her socials and her website and her book and a couple of other books that she recommended that were useful and wonderful. So I'm so glad that you're here and here's the show. The Permission to Heal podcast is sponsored by Instacart. If you're anything like me, no matter how you try to schedule your life, you're always super busy. And when it comes to doing errands and grocery shopping, we need a little help. Instacart is here to help us get our essentials delivered in as fast as an hour. It is amazing. With Instacart, you can do all your shopping online at your favorite local stores, grocery stores, pharmacies, Target, Costco, Staples, Sephora, Bed Bath & Beyond, 7-Eleven, even some liquor stores, and an Instacart shopper will shop for you. All of my Instacart shoppers have been super helpful in choosing my items. If the store is out of what I've asked for, the shopper will text me pictures of similar items for me to choose from and will change my bill to reflect the changes. Then the shopper delivers my items directly to my door. And you can choose contactless delivery, which helps keep everyone healthy and safe. I rely on Instacart for grocery shopping every week and sometimes for even my non-prescription drugstore items. 
Instacart is like having a personal assistant help me with my shopping every week. Get your groceries and essentials delivered in as fast as an hour via Instacart. New customers can get free delivery on your first order of $10 or more. Just click the link below, which will take you directly to instacart.com so you too can get the help you need. Just click the link below and you can get your groceries and essentials delivered in as fast as an hour via Instacart. New customers can get free delivery on your first order of $10 or more. Instacart.com, your personal and quick shopping assistant. You won't know how you lived without it. Thanks to all of you who support this show on Patreon. You keep Permission to Heal up and running. If you want to become a valued patron, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash permission to heal. That's www.patreon.com forward slash permission to heal. After we pay expenses, 25% goes to scholarships at the Karen Treatment Centers to transform lives impacted by addiction. Your support is contributing directly to helping people and their families transform and heal from addiction. This is a cause very close to my heart, as my mother died of the effects of opiate addiction and it tore my family to pieces. Thank you so much for supporting Permission to Heal and my mission to support others through their healing journey, through addiction, through Karen Treatment Centers. You are vital to our success. Mm -hmm. I do all the editing myself, so if we have to stop, we have to cough, someone has to pee, you know, the dog barks, it's fine. We'll just, I'll just cut all that out when I do the editing. Well, hopefully none of the dogs will bark because I've got one up here with me. One's out, two are down, one's downstairs, one's outside in the back and one's outside in the front. So, and the one downstairs is deaf. So, and he can't come upstairs. So, well, that so ends that we're then. Good. We're good with the dogs. Yeah. I had to shoo the cats out of here because they haven't seen me all day. They're used to me being home all summer and now I'm at school and they're like, where's mommy? You know, yeah, your so hair looks good, by the way. Oh, thank you. Your it hair was... looks really fluff, fluffy and well, it was up in a in a messy it's knot good. all day because it was so humid and yeah. i just took it down and it looks good thanks i can't even tell that it's sort of purple but whatever it's irrelevant all right so i do the intros after so that i can encapsulate what we did talk about ahead of uh -huh. time it's like a time warp thing um so we're just gonna pop in and say hello and then the first thing i'd normally do is the six quick six, la, 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 la. six quick, quick questions. questions yeah and and then we'll get into it you know okay. I, I haven't prepared a whole heck of a lot of questions i have the three that you posted but you know it's not like you're a stranger and you know we know what we're talking about so it'll be fine let me make sure my We've phone got some stuff is... together for you so you know yeah. And yeah. you know the Myers break, so I'm sure you'll have good questions. Yeah, I'm not a trainer though, so anyway. <laughs> so good afternoon, Carrie. How are you today? I am great, Marcy. A little bit of rain earlier today and kind of gloomy, but I'd still sometimes that's kind of nice and it's cleared up now and I'm doing great. So oh. it's good to see you. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, it took us a while, took me a while to, to get all this organized. Uh, but you and I were doing those videos last year at this time, mm -hmm. those career path videos, and that was fun. Um, but I'm so thrilled that you're here on Permission to Heal. It's awesome. Me too. Thank you. So um, let's do the six quicks and then we'll move on. Okay. Right? Okay. So what six words would you use to describe yourself? Oh, these are tough. You know, you have to think about, um, I came up with, um, the first word I came up with was optimistic. Okay. And I think a lot of that, we're going to talk about personality type today. And I think a lot of that has to do with my personality. And, you know, we've, we've been through challenging times for the last 18 months. And so with COVID and, you know, politics and just, you know, people losing their jobs and all kinds of things, but I'm always, I always tend to be an optimistic person. Mm -hmm. And again, I think a lot of that comes with my personality type. Um, I'm a person of faith. So faith, um, I believe in a higher power. I believe in a higher, that we all have a higher purpose. I believe that we're here to serve others. 
And um, so faith is, is a word that describes me, I believe, um, energetic. I have a lot of passion about the things that I love. Mm -hmm. And as an instructor, and I've been teaching now for over 20 years, one of the things I often see on my feedback forms is from people is we can tell you're so passionate about what you do. We can tell that you love what you do. Okay. So passionate, energetic, um, hopeful, hopeful came to mind. Um, and that kind of ties back to being optimistic. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I'm working with people looking for work, I always tell them, I say, hope is not a strategy. Okay. It's, it's okay to be hopeful, but hope itself is not a strategy. Like when you're looking for a job, say, well, I hope they'll call me or I hope they'll do this. I yeah, said, no, definitely not a strategy, but I've also worked with so many people and, and coaching people who have lost jobs, who have lost all kinds of hope and, you know, and been very discouraged. And ultimately, in fact, one of the ladies, I, I was at a volunteer thing last night and I'll tell you more about that later, but, um, and we were chatting and it was two years ago when she lost her job, she was a contractor and she was hoping to get on with this company full time, but it didn't work out and they lost the contract and she was very down about it. And I, and I, and as I told her, and as I tell many people is that a lot of times you will see in the future that you may end up in a better place. And she was telling me last night, she said, you know, the best thing that ever happened to me was to get laid off from that job. Right. And she's been at a company called NetApps now for about two years and she loves it. And, you know, so hope, it, it, hopeful is always a good word for me. Um, now, Marcy, you know me and I am definitely an animal advocate. Oh so my God, yeah. I don't know what word associated with that, but I am an animal lover. I am a dog mom. I'm a dog foster. Um, I couldn't describe myself without throwing in some animals. And of course I love cats too. And I know you're a big cat, cat person. Yes. And you have several cats yourself. I love I other people's dogs. And, I don't, and I don't want to have dogs myself, but I love dogs and I, I love other people's dogs, but I love my cats. Like, yeah, like my kids. Yeah. <laughs> and I have one cat named Meshach who thinks he's a dog, but um, well, he lives and, with dogs. So that yeah. makes sense. And then the last word, I, I had something else down, but I thought about it. I said, again, what describes me? And I have to use the word volunteer because I do a lot of volunteer work and I'm with three different rescue groups, dog rescue groups. I work with special Olympics for 18 years, wow. um, canine companions for independence, um, you know, a corral riding Academy where we work with at risk girls. So, and I love to volunteer. I mean, if I could get paid for volunteering, that would be great, except it wouldn't be volunteering then, right. but I mean, I love it. And I, and that's just part of my identity. So that's um, awesome. So those would be my six words. That's awesome. It's important to give back, you know, yeah. to you have gifts and talents and passion about things and, and you're a very, you have a very good soul and a warm heart. And, you know, it's a blessing to share that with other people. You know, yeah. I, I, I think that's really amazing. Thank you. And not, not a lot of people do that. You know, my, my former late father-in-law, former late, yeah. Former late father-in-law was a very big, uh, volunteer volunteered with all sorts of political organizations but also like um christmas in april which i'd never heard of until of him and uh food kitchens and you know just habitat for humanity he'd like build houses and he was a, a dynamo I did Habitat for 13 years when I lived in Atlanta. Um, I've done work with the homeless. And I just, you know, it's just, it is about giving back. But you know what? Even though you're giving. You get so much. I get so much more. I mean, I just, I, and, and you know what? The blessings that you feel knowing how fortunate you are as compared, you know, and, and it's so, even people when they lose their jobs, I said, I, one of the things I often tell them is think about other people and even go and volunteer because when people volunteer, and this is in my book too, my mm -hmm. book, Project Career Quest, is that if you will volunteer at some of these organizations, you will see how fortunate you are, even though you might be out of work right now, mm -hmm. but you will look at the situation that some of these people are in and you'll say, oh my gosh, I, and, and it will lift your spirits. It will absolutely, you know, and so it's, it's very important to do that. I agree. I agree. So, so let's, let's just dive in. Um, you, you did just for very briefly touch upon your book, Project Career Quest, Navigating the Journey to New Opportunities Waiting, um, which you published in March of 2020 just mm -hmm. as the pandemic was beginning. Um, and we right. met because our books are published by the same publisher. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and there's so much about this book that's just, that's so valuable, whether you're looking for a job or you're looking to get into college and you're trying to figure out where your life is going. There's mm -hmm. so much here that 
is um valuable and yeah and i even say you know and and actually the lady who did my um on the back cover here mm -hmm. um and she had said in her write-up that you know this book is relevant for both entry level and seasoned professionals yes and and that's true it is it's great for you know entry level folks that you know just graduating from college uh, and really helping them to find that career path or um and actually she's just recently um, looked for and got another job. She's the one I was mentioning to you the other right. day that's working up at a college in Vermont now. Oh, nice. And, and you know, she had a very, very, well, it still does. She's still there at the other university, which is a very prestigious university in Durham, North Carolina. I won't mention the name, but, um, you know, we all know that the big school that's there in Durham and, um, and she's decided to make a change and and she said you know how much the book helped her and she's That's a very wonderful. high level person at the university so um a very experienced seasoned professional um and so every level of people you know no matter where you are in that career process yeah. there's so much valuable input in there for you it helps you figure out like what your talents are and what your goals are and and teaches you how to actually do the resume and the cover letter and and how to uh, approach job applications and you know that that whole process because I mean nobody teaches that kids graduate mm -hmm. high school they graduate college you could graduate with a damn MBA from Harvard they don't teach you that yeah you know you sort of have to pick it up intuitively through osmosis or something through people around you but it's it, it, it needs to be something that's taught and through your book, you've, you've done that for the world. You know, it's interesting. And I asked her and just last Friday night, she called me to tell me that she had gotten this job up at this school in Vermont and she's going to be the Dean of student affairs. Nice. And um, she said she, two things. One she did, which people don't teach you is she asked the closing question that I have in the book. Mm -hmm. And I tell people when you're in a job interview, at the end of that interview, you ask them if they have any concerns or any reasons to believe that you wouldn't make an excellent candidate for that position. And that's basically the closing question. And she did that. And she said, they were shocked that I asked that question. And it was kind of like, you know, nobody asked that, but sure. this is an opportunity for them to, to express any concerns that they, that they have. And it's also, and here's the bigger part, this is the interviewer's opportunity to address any concern, because right. if you walk out and they have concerns, you might, you're very likely not to get the job. Um, but that really impressed them that, that she had asked that. And then the other thing is that because she's going to be the Dean of Student Affairs, the students were part of her interview process. Mm -hmm. And I talk about how to, when you're in the interview about how to connect with everyone in the room, you know, every, anybody that's in that room is there for part of the decision-making process and that you want to connect with them and give them eye contact and, and, and introduce yourself and ask their name and all like this. And she said the feedback that she got from the students and the reason they um, selected her, probably one of the main reasons they selected her is because the students loved her. She connected with each and every one of them and they felt important and seen um, and heard. And, yeah. And, it made a huge difference and that and she, and they gave her the feedback that none of the other candidates gave them that kind of uh courtesy or that respect that she had shown to them well, it's vital and, for that particular job absolutely yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah yeah there, there was a, a time way back in the early 90s when i was trying to get into um the pr game and i was in an interview and i, I was i was sitting that you know i I went in in a very corporate looking outfit and I had my hair up and I wasn't wearing a lot of jewelry and, you know, I tamed myself down a bit because mm -hmm. I thought that looking more corporate would be better. And, uh, and I got along really well with the office manager who was interviewing me. It was a really nice conversation. We had some stuff in common. I think my sister had gone to the same camp or something that she did. It was a very long time ago to remember exact details. Uh, but then she, I didn't ask that question, but she sort of asked it for me in a way. And she said, you know, I really, there's no reason why I shouldn't hire you. On paper, you look wonderful. And you're, you know, we had this lovely conversation, but I think you're a little too conservative for our company. You know, you're very... You know, you're 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 dressed just so. You're a little prim, and I and I I was like, "Are you kidding? That's what they want." I'm like, "All right." 
So I took, it was like a movie. Like I, I saw the camera pan out and I saw myself from outside and I saw that myself having this conversation with this woman and I took my hair out of the bun and I shook my hair out. I reached into my bag and I put all my rings back on and my bracelet back on and um, undid my blouse a little bit and, and uh, put on some, put literally while I was talking to her, I was putting lipstick on and I said, okay, now this is a little bit more like me and I'll tell you what I did last night. And I told her about how I went to this bar because there was this band that I liked to hear and this whole long story. And she was shocked. She, she had to like pry her jaw off the table and she's like, oh, okay, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes we try to go in thinking, you know, how how we want to appear to them, right? Uh, and sometimes that does backfire on us because it's not really who we are, right? It may not be who they're looking for. So that's yeah. that's a great story. So so the okay. lesson really is is you have to live your authenticity. You have to be who you are because you know ultimately if that prim and corporate looking woman was what they did want I would have been screwed because I couldn't maintain that forever you yeah. know I didn't have enough suits to maintain that I have all these you know artsy fartsy things you know whatever if this is just more me anyway that's a good point I mean and that's that's true because you could go in for an interview a certain way and then you show up next week at work and you're not that same person they thought they hired and and that that leads to a little idea of deception too right right I mean, they're thinking, well, you know, like she portrayed herself one way and that's not who she is. And then there's that sort of mistrust or distrust that starts the relationship out. So, right. you know, it's a great lesson learned, though. And thanks for sharing that story. Sure, sure. You know, it's it's to me just as bad as padding your resume with skills that you don't have. Absolutely. You know, there was a, a guy I graduated high school with who I heard through the grapevine lied on his resume and got fired the first day of work because he couldn't do the thing that he was hired to do. And then he was all mad that he got fired. And I just don't understand. Anyway, so I want to talk about um, Myers-Briggs typology, personality, inventories, mm -hmm. because you are a trained expert. And um, I am fascinated by this whole thing and for a, quite a long time have done um, a free online version, Young Myers-Briggs uh, mm -hmm. personality inventory with my students. And I, you know, I use it to determine which kids are introverted and which kids are extroverted and try to do like some personality matches and mismatches on purpose when putting groups together. Uh -huh. Of course, we're in COVID now, so we're not doing groups. But, you know, in theory, that's what yeah. what I would what what I always used to do. Um, and I make everybody I know <laughs> take this take this little thing. You know, I am. Um, my mind just went blank. What am I? I am an ENFJ and my husband is an INFJ. I was going to say that. I was going to say that, Marcy, because I thought I remembered that. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I, I I think that, you know, based on the description of that, that you find all over the Internet, it's an absolute match, you know, and, and I've taken the test many times over, you know, the course of a very long period of time. And it always comes out exactly the same. Um, so can I, tell you, can I tell you why it comes out exactly the same? Because I'm the same person. No, <laughs> no, no. I, if, if you don't mind, let me just jump in here with a little bit of background yeah. so that people understand this. OK, and, and I do want to say that it, some of you may take the what you find online is free. That is not actually the Myers-Briggs, but it's somebody's version of it. It's close um, because the Myers-Briggs is never offered for free. And the reason why it's not offered for free is because in order to maintain the integrity of the instrument, and I've been certified since 1999 on this, but in order to maintain the integrity of the instrument is it needs to come with someone who's certified who can ex who can go over that indicator with you properly so that it is not misused. And an instrument like that could be misused. You know, that's why you can't use a Myers-Briggs to get a job to say, here, take this Myers-Briggs and if you match up, you know, then we'll hire you. That's discrimination. And so there are certain right and wrong things to do with it. And I also say, you know, correct Marcy and correct everybody else that says this, because everybody says I took that test and it's not a test.
because a test indicates, and you know, a you're a teacher, that there's a right or wrong answer. Right. And with the Myers-Briggs, there is no right or wrong answer because what it is, it's, a, it's an instrument or an assessment to measure personality preferences. Okay. And the reason why, and let me tell you the reason why yours hasn't changed much. Okay, so a preference, and this book is written, uh, Elizabeth um, and her mother, um, Catherine, um, developed this, and this was actually developed, the instrument itself, back in 1944, during wow. World War II. And it was initially developed as a tool to help people find jobs for which they were best suited, you know, during the war, and they're trying to get, you know, and of course, it's been studied by every PhD candidate, I mean, all kinds of things over the years, and it's been refined and so forth, but it is one of the most validated instruments that exist. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and what it is based on the work of Carl Jung and Carl Jung says that we, we have our, we are born with certain personality preferences. Okay. Right. And this is the reason why it doesn't change over your lifetime. And I'll talk more about that because people always, I mean, I'm teaching these classes and a lot of times they use the Myers-Briggs and either negotiation skills or leadership courses. Those are the two primary when I'm teaching in a class. And of course I use them with individual coaching clients as well. But the, um, so he says that you're born with certain preferences. And if I could do like a quick um, sort of exercise, if you're listening to this, if you would just grab a piece of paper and a pen or pencil and, and do this little exercise with me, and then I'll explain to you what a preference is because the Myers-Briggs only measures preferences. It doesn't measure your IQ, your, you know, it doesn't measure intelligence. It doesn't measure any other thing. It measures preferences. So I want you to really understand what a preference is. So if you'll take your writing utensil and if you will write. Unless you're driving while you're listening to this, then don't yeah. do that. Well, no, don't do it you're driving. Yet. <laughs> but um, that's a good point. But if you if you can do this and when you get home, you can do this as well if you're driving now, is which you would write down your first and last name. Okay. I don't care whether you print it or put it in script or whatever. Just write down first and last name. Okay. I'm doing this too. Okay. Okay, Marcy, would yes. you now put that same writing utensil in the other hand? Okay. Okay, I would like for you to write your first and last name again. Oh, gosh. I am not a lefty. It looks like a first grader. Not to insult first graders. Okay, so if you're watching this, if you ever get a chance to watch it, you'll see it takes it's the first time Marcy wrote her name. It was very quick and very fluid. And the second time, of course, I can't see everything. And yes, yes, we can even see a huge difference between the first yeah. and the second time. And, um, and then, of course, it took her a lot more time the second time. And, of course, I always hear this when I'm doing a class. Like you said, oh, gosh, I hear other things like, what? You know, I can't do that or, you know, whatever. And so, so this is what a preference is, okay? I heard Marcia say I'm not a lefty. And I also am not a lefty. My preference is I am right-handed, okay? Mm -hmm. You're right-handed, that's your preference. When you put your writing utensil in the other hand, this is now your non-preferred hand, okay? Right. Right is my preferred hand, this is my non-preferred. This is my preference, okay? Now, who taught you to be right-handed, Marcy? Probably somewhere between preschool and kindergarten, a combination of my parent and my teachers. Do you really think you were taught to be right-handed? Well, I know that the kids who were left-handed were taught not to be left-handed, even though okay. it was their innate thing. Well, it, well, you know, I mean, so what you're saying is, is that my answer is not correct and that I taught myself to be right-handed because that was just my innate preference. You know, if you watch a botch a baby sometime and when mom or dad goes to give the small child a pacifier and the child reaches up for it, they're going to reach for it with a certain hand. They right. were not taught to be left or right handed. Now, I, I will say, you know, we're kind of in the same age bracket there. Is there was a time when left handed children were taught to be right handed because it's like, well, they don't make left handed golf clubs and they don't make left handed this and they don't make left handed that. You know? and I, so I remember this girl, Stacy, who sat next to me in kindergarten. She was starting to write with her left hand and the teacher pulled the pencil out of her hand big fat chunky pencil and put it in her right hand and put her hand around her and, and like and I remember Stacy howling and I was like why yeah, well, why are you doing that I was disgruntled exactly powerless and, and you know and here's the thing because this is a natural preference this is a learned behavior okay and those lefties that learn to write with their non-preferred hand 
It was a learned behavior. That's not a preference. And this is why when people tell me over the course of their lifetime, you know, well, when I started back in my career, I was this way, but I've changed. And I'll say, yes, I hope you've changed. But that's right. not a preference. That's a learned right. behavior. Right. Okay? Your, your core personality preference would be the same. Yeah, your, your, your leadership styles have changed because you were doing certain things based on probably your natural preferences and might find that it worked with some people and didn't work with others. So you had to learn and you had to change your behavior some and make some shifts here and there to be more effective. Ultimately, your goal when you're, let's say, leading a group of people is to, um, to connect with people and to help them to achieve whatever it is you want. So that means you're going to have to shift some. And you're going to have to change your approach some, but that doesn't mean that your preferences, that your natural preferences change. And those left-handed children, even if they learn to be right-handed, um, they, their natural preference never changed. And I bet you when they went home at night to eat dinner, they picked up their fork with their left hand Probably and, did. You know, and so forth. So that's the point I want to make about Myers-Briggs. And that's the reason why I tell people, no, you probably have, you know, your preferences don't change over your lifetime. And if you look at Carl Jung's, um, you know, theory and all that type around it, it really doesn't change. And you can watch small children and there have been people that have that have followed certain groups of children over their lifetime and found that those preferences just don't change. But we do adjust and we do we do change how we approach things, but those are all learned behaviors. And so when I'm working with people, I want them to understand the distinction between a natural preference and a learned behavior. And I'll give you an example. When my brother-in-law was in the Air Force for 23 years, um, later I figured out his Myers-Briggs and so forth. But he was not a natural soldier. I mean, if, if you look at the typical type of folks that go into the military, um, his is not sort of that, that preference right there. Um, it doesn't mean that he wasn't successful in the military. It right. just means he had to make a lot of adjustments. But once he got out, a lot of things that he was doing this way, because this is how the military wanted it done. And those of you know, if you change jobs or even retired and you did something a certain way your whole career because of the, you know, you're an accountant or whatever, and it was expected to do it this way. But when you left, you started doing things the way that you preferred to do it. You right. were going back to your natural preference versus that learned behavior. I do that with sleep. That's what I was thinking of when you were talking. You know, my job requires me to get to be in school teaching at 7.05 in the morning. So mm -hmm. I live about 25 minutes away and I know how much time it takes me to get ready and how much time it takes me to get to school. So I get up at 5, 5.15 in the morning. But that is almost directly opposite of what my preference is. And over the summer, I just go right back to what I call my summer sleep schedule. And I sleep somewhere from 2 a.m. to like 10 a.m. And that's my sweet spot. And it is just, you know, that's my preference. That's yeah. where my body's comfortable. Mm -hmm. and, yep. You know, but can't do that and maintain my job. So that's right. That's right. That's a great example. Okay. So what Myers Briggs does is it has four continuum continuum continua four scales it has four, four scales. scales that's better four scales um to to assess your the degree to which you are one way or the other in four different categories um can you explain that briefly and then we'll get into why it's applicable to careers and 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 even to just really get to know yourself better. I mean, this whole podcast is about healing and different ways of getting to know and respect and love ourselves and take care of ourselves and so on. And and I think knowing w where I fit in on those scales helped me get to know myself and love and respect myself more. Absolutely. And and I wanted to start with that even before the four scales, because I wanted to say for your, for your listeners is, you know, this is all about healing, permission to heal and so forth. Right. And the more that we know and understand ourselves, who we really are at the core versus who somebody says we need to be, you know, exactly. like, oh, you're in this and you got to do this for school or you got to sleep these hours or you got to do this kind of thing or whatever. But the more we know ourselves and, you know, and, and that seems like so, um, I, what's the word I want? But I mean, it seems so strange. It's like, I am who I am. I should know myself, but we really don't. No, and, don't and I think the hard I questions that we should ask. Yeah. They don't know themselves and it's like and somebody's going to college and what do you want to do i don't know and you know what do you love doing i don't know and you know all that kind of stuff and so you know if we're going to heal and really 
learn to love ourselves is we have to know ourselves and that's that awareness. So, so that's how this really fits in with your permission to heal. Um, and, and in so many ways, and, but let me talk about the four scales now. So the first scale of the Myers-Briggs is the extroversion introversion scale. Mm -hmm. And what that measures, and it's not what a lot of you think, it's not about who talks more, okay? Which is a lot of people say, it doesn't, it really has to do with where you get your energy. Right. And, and Marcy, you, you're an ENFJ. I'm also an extrovert and extroverts get their energy from being around people. Okay. Um, and introverts get their energy from time alone. Right. So I'm it, kind we, of like on the cusp of, of both. Like if you could be like almost dead in the middle of E and I, you know, I'm also. Each of the scales, each of the scales goes, it's called slight, moderate, clear, and very clear. And so you might have a slight preference to extroversion, okay? And this is why when people say to me, I changed last time I was an introvert, this time an extrovert or vice versa. Those folks are the ones that are probably on that slight, right? you know, and, and one time they took it and they came out as an E and other, you know, they might be 13, 12, and next time they're 12, 13 on the numbers, okay? Um, and it's just because they have a slight preference. Right. Okay, versus a very clear preference. Um, I mean, I but, find myself very much energized by talking to other people in mm -hmm. small groups, in large groups, really not so much large groups, but in smaller groups, like classroom size or smaller, I'm really the most sure. comfortable. But I also find that because I'm so, I think, sensitive to everyone, to what's going on and really paying attention to everything that's going on, that by the time I get to the end of a school day or really the end of a work week, I, I need alone time to recharge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the recharge is with people and sometimes the recharge is alone. Like I sure. need to leave me, leave me alone. I'm not fit for company. I just need to not hear anything. And I mean, I've spent, before I got remarried, I've spent whole weekends by myself sure. in a silent house, not saying anything or talking to anyone. And it was just heaven, you know. Yeah. But that's yeah. not always heaven. You know, sometimes I need to go out and see other people. So whatever. Well, you know, I'm I'm more on the clear end of that um, spectrum for the extrovert. But even if you're, you know, clear, even very clear, you, we all need some time alone. Yeah. And time to, to re-energize. It's just that I don't need as much time as an introvert would need. And an introvert okay. would be like, okay. And I'm a project management, a project manager by trade, right? So, you know, and anybody who's in project management and leading project teams are around people all day. Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you have to be an extrovert to be a good project manager. A lot of introverts are, are great project managers, but at the end of the day, and especially let's say they're out of town, okay, with a group of people. At the end of the day, they're the ones that I might be the person going, hey, who wants to meet for dinner? Let's meet in the lobby at six. And they're the ones that said, thanks, I'll see you in the morning. I'm, I'll call room service, right? right. Because they need that time to re-energize and plug in I, I think of it as like you know taking your computer and plugging it in the wall sure. it's like you, gotta, you just got to re-energize and you know as an extrovert I also need that time but I don't need as much time and if I spend too much time alone as an extrovert then I actually start to lose energy because I'm energized by being around people so you know COVID for a lot of you that during this time that you might be working from home if you're an extrovert you might find that your energy is starting to wane yeah. and you have to go out and meet people you know with your mask on or whatever outside just to be around some people whereas many of you who are introverts during this time might find like wow well, this is heaven you know this is great right so I can get my work done. I'm so much more productive. I'm not around people all day that they're draining me. Um, you know, so it's, uh, I mean, I think all of you, if you're listening to this, can think about your own personal experience and probably have a pretty good feeling of where you are, you know, maybe not whether you're slight, moderate, clear, or very clear, um, but, you know, knowing where you are in that, on that scale of extroversion, introversion, and really, again, is how and where you, where you get your energy. Cool. So that's the first scale. The second scale is the sensing and intuitive scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that this is either an S or an N for intuition because they've already used the I for introversion. So if you're looking at letters, it's E for extroversion, I for introversion, sensing of the S and then the N for intuitive. So this scale has to do with how you collect information. Okay. Do you collect it through your five senses? Okay. Um, in order to understand, I need to feel it, touch it, smell it, taste it, you know, all that kind of, you know, see it, um, my five senses. And, um, and sensors also tend to be past and present oriented. So they draw from the past to understand the present. 
you know, well, tell me, and, and, and here's the thing, this is how people communicate. So you can pick up clues from people on what they say. So if they say, well, Marcy, tell me, give me the background on that. I need the historical data, you know, right. give me more information so I can understand it. It's very likely that there are sensing preference. Now an intuitive will be a person that they are more where the sensors are into facts and data and they're kind of like down here at this mm -hmm. level, right? The intuitives are up here, they're pie in the sky and they're the big picture people. And they're the ones that say, don't give me all, don't give me all the details, just give me the executive summary, give me the big picture view. Right. And they're telling you in their words, who they are. I mean, mm -hmm. if you listen to that and think about the words that you use, intuitives are big picture people and intuitives are also future focused. Okay, where the sensors are past and present, give me more data, give me more information, tell me what happened in the past. The intuitives are more focused on, okay, Marcy, let's say we get this contract. Think about the future possibilities. What can we do moving forward? And mm -hmm. they're what they're going to be interested in, especially let's say you're making a presentation to them, is they're not going to be as interested in all the bogged down detail. They're like, where are we going with this? Okay. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. And that's how you take in that data. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you want me to keep going or do you yeah, have it? Yeah, yeah, I'm liking this. That's just good. Okay, so the this third is good. skill is, is your thinking and feeling preference, which of course is a T for thinking and F for feeling. And this has to do with once we take in information, by the way, the second and third scale, the sensing, intuitive, thinking, and feeling, these are what are called mental scales. These are mental functions, not mental scales, mental functions. Okay. Because we take in information and then we make decisions based on it. Okay. And thinking preferences tend to make their decisions based on the logical implications. They make their decisions from their head and they look at things like what is the impact on, on the bottom line? What is the impact on the economy? What is the impact on return on investment? They look at the impact on things. Mm -hmm. okay. Feeling preferences tend to make their decision based on things like values, um, um, they tend to make their decisions based on the, well, they're, they're people focused. So it's about the impact on people, you know, where the, th where the thinkers are looking at, you know, the bottom line, return on investment, like that, the, the feelers are saying, okay, that's great. But what about, how's it going to impact my employees? How's it going to impact the students? How does it impact our shareholders? How does it impact our uh, customers and our community? So they're, what they want to hear if you're communicating with them is more about the people impact where the thinkers are more like, you know, the thing, how it does it impact, you know, return on investment and that type of stuff. Um, very clear. Yeah. And then of course I said, the thinkers they they make their decisions from their heads, feeling, make it from their hearts. Okay. So, that, so it's more about empathy and compassion and that type of stuff where the thinking preferences are, you know, more about principles and best practices and things like that. So again, listen to what people say. They'll give you a lot of clues in what they say of what their preferences are. And then the final scale is um, an external scale. The extroversion introversion scale is an external scale, as well as the judging and perceiving scale, the J and the P scale, okay? The, one, the two in the middle are mental functions. The, the first and the fourth scales are external. And the J and the P, the judging scale has to do with, or both the scales, um, the letters have to do with how you like your world structured and organized. And that's why I say it's external because I could go into somebody's house or in their office or look in their car. I mean, I could look at their physical environment and probably get a good feel um, for whether they're a judging or perceiving preference. You know, really? J's want everything structured and organized. J's want to, and this is their motto, they want to have a plan and work the plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, now a P and Marcy, even the way you dress and you said this free flowing artsy fartsy kind of stuff, yeah. that's P's dress, by the way, but you're a J, see, you might be kind of in the middle there, but a lot of well, times. Well, I fancy myself fly by night, not fly by night, but I fancy myself, um, flexible and easy peasy and you know like to go with the flow kind of thing and there yeah, are and some things about that that are dead on true like my interpersonal relationships are like that uh -huh. but I like my schedule I like knowing what's going to happen next I like to have a plan it sure. makes me comfortable it makes me feel good like the beginning of the school year every year is a shit show for me 
m wow. emotionally because although I've worked in the same building for more than 20 years, as you know, I don't know what other school buildings do, but every year our rooms change. Every year the courses that we teach have the potential to change. We've got new students coming in and out and a zillion d details to learn about them. And then based on our schedule, we have different periods off. And so you have different p different colleagues that you're have your, your free or professional periods with. So sure. there's a lot that's the same, but there's also a lot that's different. And then I'm getting off of my preferred sleep schedule and now I'm forcing myself to get up at 5 a.m. So it takes me a while, but but I- Can you say that I'm guessing that you might be on the slight scale of the J yeah. and the P scale? Because be. you, used, you used a couple of words here that are exactly how, you know, I told you that the motto for the J is have a plan and work the plan, okay? Right. And I'm a project manager, I'm a P preference, but I'm a project manager. And in project management, you need to have a plan and work the plan. But you also have to, and you use these words exactly, you also have to learn to go with the flow sometimes as a project manager, because things don't always go this, the way you want it to. Right. And here's the P's motto. Theirs is, well, theirs is go with the flow. I mean, versus have a plan and work the plan. Theirs is go with the flow. And P's like their world structured in a way that it's flexible and adaptable. Right. They like to be able to adapt to the situation. And that's why... A P. Yeah, I'm probably dead in the middle of these two things. Yeah, I'm thinking you're, but even the way the way you dress is very P personality because yeah. J's tend to also dress more in the tailored. If you look, if you really dig deep into Myers Briggs, they tend to like a more tailored look, a more you know. I'm not mm -hmm. saying necessarily corporate, but it's more tailored, and the P's tend to be more free free flowing and so forth. So even if we look at sometimes what people wear and stuff like that, we'll get right. some. Clues. And I see a lot of of both of those with you. Um, but, you know, as a project manager, and, and this is funny, this comes up a lot when I'm teaching project managers, because project managers that are J's are like, see, the J's are the best project managers. And I say, yeah, but what happens when change happens? Okay. Right. And it happens all the time. Either you're flexible or you break. <laughs> The P's are like, yeah, no problem. Go with the flow, right? And mm -hmm. the J's are like, what do you mean there's going to be change? I have a whole plan put together. I've got this thing already mapped out. I've got this, you know, I've got my work breakdown structure and I've got everything done and you, you're changing it. And they have much more difficulty in adjusting to change than the P who just says, well, that's the way it is. And, you know, and, and we go with that. So again, there's no right or wrong on any of these. There's no judgment. No, it's just and that's why again, it's not a test. It's just a preference, but that's why we can't say that J's are better than P's or anything like that. It's like, it's the, it's the variety of people on a team um, and what we bring to the team. And that's what we're looking at is we, we all bring different strengths to the team. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's nice too. And when I work with, uh, um, an intact team to do their Myers-Briggs and we can do a team assessment and look where they are. And we can also then, I can look at how many E's and I's and S and N's and, you know, um, T and F's and J and P's. And I can tell them where their strengths are going to be as a team. And I can also tell them where they're going to struggle as a team. Cause if they have all J's and one P or all N's and, and one or two S's or whatever, if they have too much of one or the other, they're going to find it a struggle at time. Sure. And I'm not saying that you should go through and pick your team by, you know, we got to have the exact same number of this or that. But the reality is if you understand what your challenges are going to be, you can be more um, open to and, and, and more able to deal with those types of things. And sometimes if we're a little bit unbalanced in areas, we might have to pull in other resources occasionally to say, hey, help us in this process here. So, but that's, that's in a nutshell, those are the four scales of the Myers-Briggs. I don't think I've ever had anybody ever explain that to me as succinctly and as clearly and helpfully. I now like realize that I had been explaining it for a number of years in a completely ass backwards sort of way. <laughs> it's, you know, I have, um, I believe it's chapter 13 in this book. I think that's what I, I looked it up earlier, page 205, understanding personalities and communication styles. And I go through all the stuff in there that I just explained to you, Marcy, and, and a lot more. And, you know, and, and part of the reason why I put this in here, and, and I'm very clear in my book to say that you can read through my examples here and try to figure out what your what your four letter type is. But I'm also very clear to say this is not the Myers Briggs. I'm just giving you kind of the sure. you know, big picture view of it and so forth. But the reason it's in here is because it's important when you start trying to connect in a job interview, 
teaching, trying to connect with your students, trying to connect with your audience. Many of you listening may be speakers, um, trainers. You, you want to connect with your total audience. And I have um, at the very end of this chapter, a process which is called the Z communication model of how using the Myers-Briggs so that you can connect to your total audience. Because here's what happens. If you are, let's say like Marcy and ENFJ, um, and let's say Marcy's a strong ENFJ, okay? I think I have a feeling she's sort of um, slight in some of those categories, but let's say she's very strong and her preference is clear, very clear, something like that. The natural tendency for all of us is to speak our own language. Right. And we think we're very clear in relating to the audience. And let's say we are speaking to an audience of 100 people, okay? If I'm speaking to an audience of 100 people and I'm an ISTJ, which I'm not, but if I was... I'm going to be speaking the ISTJ language and I'm totally not going to connect with the ENFPs and the ENFJs and right. other people in that room, but using the model in the book, and it's all based on the Myers-Briggs, I have tell people how they can communicate in a way that will connect with their entire audience. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to make sure, you know, if you are making a presentation, let's say you're in sales and I'm trying to sell this to a customer and they've got a number of people in there, or I'm trying to sell myself to a hiring manager or a panel interview, you know, people that are doing an interview for me. Uh, you know, I have to make sure that I'm connecting to, with everyone in the room. Like I said, this lady did in giving everybody eye contact, but also the words that I choose and how I describe things is I have to not just speak my language mm -hmm. and what's comfortable for me, but I, you know, if I'm a big picture person, it'd be easy for me to go to big picture, but I also need to tell some of the details and, and I've got to, you know, talk about the, what I've done in my career and how it impacted the bottom line. And, and maybe I'm more into talking about how it impacts people, but if I'm not talking about the other aspect of it, I've lost part of my audience. And so that's why Myers-Briggs is so important, you know, in how you live your life, how you relate to people, how you communicate to people. Um, it's not just a, uh, it, it's definitely a career tool. That's what it was designed as, sure. but it's so much more than that. And it will help people in that healing process too, Izzy, because I, you know, Marcy, I know you've been going through this for a long time and I read your book and because we were the same publisher, I was reading Marcy's book. And I'll tell you, there were times at night that I would text Marcy and go, oh my gosh, I can so relate to that. Yes, you, know, you are. Remember right. that? Remember that? Mm -hmm. And it would be like 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. And you were always up. And I was like, that must have been time when you weren't in school. Yeah, I'm a night yeah. owl. So, and yeah. um, I was like, oh my gosh, because there's so much about your experience with your mother that I could, you know, like totally relate to. Uh -huh. um, and I do know that based on your personality type and mine as well, that some of the things that I experienced as a child, um, I'm able to work through it easier than either of my siblings because their personality types are different. And it's oh. part of it is my optimism that comes with, with being an intuitive feeler and you're an NF, an intuitive feeler. And, and there's a certain optimism that comes with that and a certain thing that kind of helps us move beyond certain things. Uh -huh. uh, and so the more that you understand about yourself and the more you can learn to love yourself, forgive yourself, to move beyond somebody else's judgment of you or words that people chose. And, and I call them the gremlins. I mean, I talk about it in the beginning of the book, the first three yeah. chapters of the book are about if someone's lost their job or maybe they're looking for their first job out of college or, you know, they, you know, they've been a stay at home mom or dad and they're trying to get back into the workforce and it's easy to get discouraged in that process. Mm -hmm. And, and then we start to hear these voices. And sometimes it's somebody in your family or a friend that says, Oh, you're too old to do that. Or you'll never get into that industry. You've never done it before or whatever. And those are those voices too, but there's also those voices in our head. And again, I refer to them as the gremlins. And those voices come back to what our moms used to tell us or our dad. Who do you think you are to say that? What's your experience? Why do you think you're so special? Yeah, all those. Why would anybody listen to you? Listen, exactly. Yeah. And so and so learning to, to understand who you are and start saying, this is who I am versus this is who somebody else said I was mm -hmm. or what somebody else said I could or couldn't do. You know, and it's, it's just, it's very freeing. And I, and I've gone through this instrument with so many people over time. And it's just when people get it and they go through it and they really grasp it and then they will take it. And, and here's the other thing I would challenge any of you that are listening now, if you say, oh, I, I took that test, which is not, again, that indicator, that inventory years ago, but I can't remember my four letters. Right. Right. Um, 
And it's because you didn't apply it after you took the, the instrument in the inventory. And it is one of those things that you don't just take it and then go, okay, that was interesting. Let me, you know, toss it over here because you can't learn from it. You can't develop yourself from it and you can't grow from it. But there's so many opportunities to grow and learn from having taken this instrument and to be a better communicator and to be a better um, connector and to be a better mother or father or, mm -hmm. you know, Years ago, I was teaching a class, and I think it was in Ottawa, Canada, and one of my students, we did the, I think it was a negotiation skills class, and we did uh, the Myers-Briggs in there, and they came up to me like the next morning or something. They said, Kira, you know, the instrument yesterday was really interesting. Um, actually, my wife and I took it years ago when we got married, and the Catholic Church tend to use it a lot, at least that's what I've heard, and um they said the priest told us years ago, we're based on our Myers-Briggs personality type, where we would have challenges in our marriage. And he said, you know, we've been married 20 years now. And he said, oh my gosh, when you did that review yesterday, it was like, it all came back to me. And, and he was exactly right. But he said, okay. the other thing that I wanted to share with you is this reminds me of another book that my wife and I recently have been working through. Um, and it's a book by a man named Gary Chapman, who actually happens to be from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And it's called The Five Love Languages. Yes. Have you heard Fabulous. of that? Book, yeah, right? I read it. It's a wonderful it's a, book. It is a great book. And he said, this Myers-Briggs reminds me of The Five Love Languages. And if you've not read it, I highly recommend it. If you're in any kind of relationship, in fact, I buy it when I have friends that get engaged or their kids or, you know, mm -hmm. I'll buy it for them as an engagement gift and say, you both need to read it, you know, and sometimes someone will go, I'll give this to my fiance and have him read it or something. It's like, no, 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 yeah. you both need to read this yeah. because it's, it's very similar to the Myers-Briggs in some respect, because it's basically Gary Chapman goes through five love languages of touch and feel, words of affirmation, um, acts of service, quality time, and which one am I missing, Marcy? Um, gifts. Gifts, gifts, okay. And when you read it, I remember when I read it, I thought, oh my gosh, and my parents were married for 54 years before my mother passed away, okay? Wow. But there was a lot of conflict in their marriage. I mean, it was not a perfect marriage by any means, not even close, but they, you know, they stuck it out. And, um, but when I look back at it, I went, oh my gosh, it's so clear that my mother's love language was acts of service. Mm -hmm. That was not my dad's love language. He would buy her gifts and bring it home and she'd go, I don't need this. You take right. it back. I don't need it. Why are you spending money on this? Why don't you stay home and do something around here or whatever? You know, right. I could just see where the conflict Big disconnect. Is. Yeah. But, you know, the disconnect is, is that my father was trying to speak his love language to her thinking mm -hmm. that that would please her. And, sh and she would come back with, you know, why don't you stay around here and do something? And she Which sure made it invalidated him and made him feel unseen. Right. Absolutely. And so, but the point of that is that we all have our natural love language. And while we're trying to show love to others, it doesn't always come across that way. And if mm -hmm. we can understand where they're coming from and show them their love language, it may be uncomfortable. We may have to get out of our comfort zone for a while to do that. But once we learn to do that and read the other person, that's what Myers-Briggs is about. Myers-Briggs is about learning to read people, listening mm -hmm. to what they say, um, you know. And how they behave and trying to figure who they, figure out who they are so that you can have a genuine relationship with them. A genuine relationship and that they are connecting with you because, it, and again, if we only look at it from our perspective to say, well, this is the way I am. So they must, you know, this must work for them too. It's not, that's not reality. No. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we do that on, on a slightly different, a different way. We do that when we're teaching because I'm a visual learner. I learn and absorb information. I need to see the thing in front of me. You know, I'm a good listener and I love audiobooks and things. But if you really want me to understand a topic that I've never heard of before that has a lot of detail, I need to see it. Yeah. If I only taught as a visual learner to other visual learners, then I miss out or I don't hit the mark. I don't connect with the people who learn by auditory sense, their auditory sense. I don't learn. Uh, I, I don't connect with the people who are kinesthetic learners that they have to actually do the thing or move around, you know? Sure. So as a teacher, you have to make sure that each lesson is hitting all three to make sure that you're, you're keeping everybody in taking everybody along with you. It's, it's kind of the same thing metaphorically. It, it, absolutely. And you know, there's a book called Myers-Briggs and, and Learning Styles. 
Right. And, and, you know, if you have children, it's so important to understand that, that they all have different learning styles. And the reason why some children do so poorly in school, I mean, you can look at some of the brightest people out there, you know, Albert Einstein, you know, they thought he was, you know, mentally challenged and, you know, don't, whatever words they use, but it's just, he wasn't learning in a, in a situation that was his learning style. Right. And so if we understand that, and there's plenty of, of, of um, information and data out there about different learning styles as it relates to Myers-Briggs, and that will help to understand that maybe your child, my cousins went through this and they moved, he, he was an attorney with Microsoft for many years. He just retired recently, but they've been living in France for 25 years now, Wow, maybe. And, um, but when they moved there, the French schools, Mark said, you know, even more so than the American schools, the French schools are, are very rigid and they only teach one way. That's one style. Now, again, if you're French and I'm saying something that's not, but this was his experience anyways. And this right. is what he related to me. No offense to French schools. <laughs> and it was fine for their older daughter, but for their younger daughter, Elena, it wasn't working. And so they ended up, um, they lived in Crepierre, which is about 45 minutes out of, out of Paris. Um, but he worked in, in uh, Le, Le Defense in Paris. And um, so they ended up putting her in a, a French American school, the international school in Paris. And they had to move her to a different school because it just wasn't working mm -hmm. where she was going to school. This, and it, it wasn't that she wasn't a smart girl or anything. It's just, they weren't teaching to her style. And right. so whether it's communicating or relating or teaching, um, you know, we all have different styles. And that's why it's that's why the Myers Briggs is such a valuable tool, and and I you know so highly recommend. I use DISC. I use a lot of other tools, and DISC is great in team building and stuff like that. But nothing that I know of goes as in in depth as the Myers Briggs, and that's why a lot of times, and if it's a team building activity, we might use something like DISC because it's a faster, easier learn type of thing. But if you really want to dig into things and, and you've got, you know, um, and, and that's why I use it in career coaching, because I really want to help people figure out people like me. And I know one of the questions that you had um, of your questions was, um, what would you t tell yourself, your younger self? Okay. And Wait, we didn't even get through them all, did we? You only went through the first one. So wow, I totally, we got so, I, I was so interested in what you were saying that I okay. completely we can circle back Ooh. around. We can circle back <laughs> around. But I did want to say, I did want to say the question, I think it was number five that said, what would you tell your younger self if you yeah. could go back? And I would say, get some coaching in high school, in college. I mean, and, and your career path, one of the questions about my career path, you know, when I went to college, I had no clue what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. This is part of the reason I'm so passionate about what I do now, because I had to learn all this. I wasn't one of those people that went like my neighbor's child. She wants to be a vet. And she just started her first year in college and she, her goal is to go to vet school. And, and she's brilliant. She got into every school she applied to, including Duke, including Vanderbilt, including, you know, some very prestigious schools. She's decided to go locally here to NC State, but NC State's tied with Ohio State for the fifth best vet school in the country right well, there you go Perfect. and she knows what she wants to do and you know she can still change her mind but i had no clue when i went to college right. and i just went I and, I, and and i used what i call it the dartboard approach you know like oh what do you want to major oh okay well let's <laughs> right. take political science right. right okay i you know i like my professors i like some of the classes take that and maybe i'll figure it out one of these days but i graduated and i was then i was getting scared i was like oh my gosh what am i gonna do so a friend of mine had gone to paralegal school and I thought, well, let me try that. So I went to Atlanta, I went to paralegal school and that's how I started my career at, with a you know, telecommunication company, the phone company in Atlanta, Georgia, which was later Bell South Telecommunication. <laughs> but I would go back and tell my younger self is, is, you know, there's help out there that can help you. And I could have carved 20 years of, you know, I mean, I learned a lot along the way. And honestly, to teach the project management courses, I teach everything from fundamentals to PMP exam prep for certification, mm -hmm. leadership, negotiation skills, you know, all types of things related to project management. And I learned it in my career and different things. Sure, you but learned I, on the move. And But my last three years there, I, you know, and I kind of fell into project management and that's a whole interesting story in itself. But my last three years, I was doing education um, and professional development. And I was over education and professional development for supply chain management at Bell South. And that was nine states, 600 plus employees. And I knew by then that I loved what I was doing as a project manager. I mean, I ended up 
doing warehouse engineering. Okay. I went from um, writing technical documents and writing business plans to, it was in a where, and they moved me over to warehouse group to do this for them. Mm -hmm. And next thing I know, my boss says, Carrie, I need someone to go to Florida and help Manuel down there. And we're going to, you know, build a 150,000 square foot building addition. And then we're moving stuff up from Miami and we're doing all this stuff and I need someone down there to help them. So voila, next thing I know, and I call it the magic wand approach, you know, in my career, they pull out the magic wand. I'm down in Jacksonville, Florida as a project manager, helping to, with this massive project that was, you know, a, a, like two, three year project, right? I didn't know anything about it, but the guys that I worked with, they were all civil engineers, right? Okay. And, um, or they were civil or industrial engineers and they were engineers. And, but I, that was the first time in my career that I wasn't doing the corporate thing, you know, back in the mm -hmm. day, we used to wear a suit to work, you know, and, you know, um, and, sitting behind a desk all day and that's when i realized i hate sitting behind a desk that's right. not me but yeah. i would have known that had i not gotten that opportunity to do that and i learned all about how to be a project manager and and then you know i i'm one of those people i love to learn so I, every time they offered a course you know if it was something that interests me i'm like i'm i'm there i'm there i'll do it i take it you know and and it was funny when i worked in that warehousing group i was the only female and i was the youngest by far i was the youngest in that group and the guys that i worked with they started poking at me like well how come you get to go to all these training classes we never get to go to any i was like um when was the last time you asked right. well you won't let us go i said have you asked and they're like he won't let us go. I said, you haven't even asked. I said, here's what you do. I put together something that says, here's how it, this class will benefit the company. Here's how it will benefit me. And then I put the ask in. I make, you know, it's like, here's why it's worth your money to send me to the class. Right. And, and he never turned me down. And he sent me to all kinds. I took seven project management classes to get a master's certificate from George Washington University in project management. I eventually, after I left the company, got my PMP certification. Um, but I took all kinds of, and I loved training. I loved being in the classes. And I used to look at the trainers going, I think I could do that. I think mm -hmm. I would like doing that. And of course, then my little gremlins would go, yeah, but what if you get sick? What if you don't feel good? What if your nose is running? And what if you, you know, uh, I think and you, you wipe your nose, of, you know, got to stand in front of people and you got to feel good and be perky like they are, you know, what if, and you know, the, the little gremlins telling me, you know, um, but I eventually got past the gremlins and said, you know what, I think I can do that. And that's how I ended up doing what I do because it's like, I, and I was teaching a couple classes in-house, nothing really exciting. I was teaching ethics within Bell South and we had to do eth once a year ethics training, mm -hmm. compliance type stuff. And so I taught that to management and non-management. And then I also did, um, I was a certified purchasing manager and I taught the CPM training so that our other purchasing managers, I was a, a contract manager for a while um, so that they could go out and get a certification as a as a purchasing manager and you know it's kind of dry topics but it was still i still enjoyed it i enjoyed being in the classroom i enjoyed helping other people learn and expand their horizons and learn new things and and get new jobs as a result of that you know because they've got a, a certification as a purchasing manager or whatever mm -hmm. and you know with 15 years in my company i said you know am i going to stay for 30 could i stick around here another 15 years. And honestly, at that point, they were already outsourcing a lot of stuff. They'd outsourced the, the training department. That's why I was doing it internally in supply chain management because my vice president said, we don't have anyone that focuses on us anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so he created that position and they asked me to take that position. And, and I loved it because Marcy, here's the best thing about it. There was no job description. There was nobody to tell me what to do. That's right. the first time in my you life could I write totally it yourself. created a job. And I know when I left, I had that job for three years. I had people would email me and call me and go, we miss you. There's nobody here advocating for us. Nobody doing this, you know. Um, but I knew at that point, uh, about 15 years in, that I, I wanted to do training on a full-time basis. And if I was going to do it, it was time to make a move. And so I went back to school. I got my master's degree, got my PMP certification. And then I was able to leave and combine my love for training with, with the project management and the leadership type stuff and all. And, and that's sort of, you know, my career path. I mean, there were many other jobs in between, but again, sure. I can take even all the way back to my paralegal job and my warehouse engineering job and my writing technical documents and business plans and purchasing and all of that. And 
and use those stories and those experiences to share with other people in their career path, as well as, you know, because a lot of the people I work with are project managers and they'll come up to me at class and say, how did you make the transition? Um, you know, what did you do? And that was part of the reason why I decided to write the book, because it, I see so many people struggling yeah. and not happy, not feeling that they're in meaningful, engaging and purposeful, you know, fulfilling jobs. And I thought, well, I've been on that path. Mm-hmm. And, you know, why not tell people how I did it and what I learned along the way? And of course, and by that time, also, I had been um, volunteering at a local uh, job seeker group and ended up taking a job as a contractor um, with a company uh, called Lee Hecht Harrison. And we go into big companies like Cisco and Lenovo and IBM and, you know, big companies like that. And they lay people off and I go in and I help them with their resumes and their interviewing skills and how to network and how to negotiate. I'm sure they're grateful for that because they don't know what the hell they're doing next. Uh, Exactly. And then I thought, well, you know what? I see these people in job seeker groups that don't have these nice corporate packages and they're struggling you know, it's a year, they've been here over a year and they're still looking and they, and they haven't made much progress. You know, they show up, even if they show up every Monday, that's only one Monday, one week, you know, and this week they might talk about resumes and, and then it takes you weeks to get your resume, right? I mean, it's not something that comes that easily. You can't just go and, you know, next week you got this perfect resume, especially if you started off with nothing or a terrible resume. Mm-hmm. It takes what it takes a while to really hone it and get it and tweak it and get it where it's, it's, you know, marketable. I mean, it's going to sell you. And then you you could have different versions of your resume for different jobs, you know, changing the focus, the wording of the things to to focus to specific niches. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, that's that. I mean, that's why, that's why I wrote Project Career Quest, because it's like, I can, I feel very passionate about being able to help those folks and help people. And even people who have corporate packages, I mean, those usually only last, when I left my company, they gave me a fabulous package. And gave me salary and they gave me, and here's the best thing. I had benefits for three years after I left the company. Like nobody does what I got at that time. Nobody does it now. And so, um, you know, people may get a package, but a lot of those packages are one month, maybe, maybe three months if people are lucky now. And, and so it's like, well, yeah, they learned a little bit, but there's still so much to learn. And that's what I have here in project career quest. And, you know, you've been through this and, um, you know, not been through the the program, but you've looked, you've had a copy of the book for a while and you've looked through it. And then there's also 57 tools right now, 50 plus tools on here in the book. And uh, most of them are on my website. It's a hidden page. And once you buy the book, there's a password that comes with it. And so all kinds of tools to really help people, um, you know, and, and earlier you talked about what they don't teach you in school. I don't care if you're in graduate school, what, they don't teach you how to negotiate a good salary and oh, benefit God, no. and stuff. I know. And as a woman, you know, I, I had a very hard time with this because I, I was afraid to negotiate for what I knew I needed to live because I <laughs> undervalued myself. Mm hmm. You know, and I was afraid that if I spoke up and didn't take what they offered, that the job offer would go away. And then I was working for a job and resentful because I wasn't making enough money to pay my bills. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you know what you just said, and that's the key to it. People are afraid to ask, and women more so than men. Yes. And when we say men make more money than we do, it's because men ask more often than women. Okay. They ask a lot more often and they get it. They may not get everything they ask for, but they're willing to ask and and women less willing to ask. And, but people say all the time, I'm afraid to ask because they'll pull the offer. And it's very interesting. I have this story in my book years, uh, several years ago, I was teaching here locally in in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I live for a um, financial company. And they had a call center over really very close to the Raleigh Durham airport. And I, their human resource manager came down from Connecticut or uh, she was somewhere up in Connecticut or Massachusetts. And um, she flew down for the day. And when she got there, she met me and everything. She said, do you mind if I sit in on your sessions? And, you know, morning was like resumes and afternoon was interviewing skills. And I said, sure, absolutely. And I said, if you, if while I'm going through this, if you have anything to say, anything to add, a question, anything, please, please do speak up. Don't, you know, do. so she was there and I don't think she said anything in the morning, but when we got to the afternoon and was talking about negotiating skills and I was talking about, you know, 
um, how to prepare to ask for, for what you want, how to do your research and sites to do your research and all this and, and a whole list of things that you could ask about your compensate be above, be, beyond salary, the compensation package and all. And I was telling people not to be afraid to negotiate because here's the quote I have in the book. If you don't ask, I think Nora is always going to be no. The answer is always no, right? Okay. And so the HR manager um, puts her hand up. I love this. I was like, oh my gosh, this was gold. She puts her hand up. She said, Carrie, can I add something here? I said, well, sure, of course. And um, she said, I just want to tell you all this. She said, when I hired you, and she said, I hired most of you in this that are here today. And she'd been with the company for 20 years. She said, when I hired you, as the HR manager for this company, I am only allowed to offer you the basic compensation package. That's all I'm allowed to offer you. But if you ask for more, I can consider it. Huge. It's huge, yes. And you should have seen like, Marcy, these people were sitting there like this and all of a sudden it was like, you could just see their face. It was like, what? You know, and she said, you, I can ask, you can, you know, and she said, you, I, you can ask for more, but I can't offer it to you. I just can't offer you any more. But if you ask, I can take it into consideration. She said, I can't promise you're going to get it, uh, all of it, you know, but it's likely you might get some of what you're asking for as long as it's reasonable. So one lady put her hand up and she goes, but I'm afraid, and this is what you said, Marcy, I'm afraid if I ask for something that they'll pull the offer. And she mm -hmm. said, let me tell you something. She said, I have been doing this for 20 plus years now. And she said, I in 20 years have only pulled two offers in 20 years for somebody wow. asking for more. And she said, and the reason I pulled those two offers is because the two people, what they asked for was so unreasonable. It was just no way I could do it. But she said, if you ask for something reasonable, then I will consider it. And, I, and there's another a great example in the book where um, a lady that I know actually did their project management training for them, uh, a pharmaceutical company um, that uh, was in Wilmington, North Carolina. And then I did their PMP prep training, trained their project, their managers, project managers for their certification. And then she reached out to me a couple of years later and said, hey, I don't know if you know, I left that company. I'm with another pharmaceutical company now. I've only been there a year. But we got to stage three of drug development and, and basically shut down. Okay. If you don't make it to stage four, you're done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's a small kind of a clinical research organization, uh, you know, startup company. And she said, I know they're going to be laying people off. She said, I just don't want to wait for the layoff because I've only been here a year. Um, so I'm very likely to be laid off. So she said, will you help me redo my resume? And, you know, so anyway, so she hired me to, to get things in order and she started interviewing and um, it's funny because they were going to lay off 50 people and they were only keeping five and they actually asked her to stay. Oh, um, they well, wanted, now she had options. Yeah. But she had options, but she had said no, that she'd already decided she was going to move on. So, um, so she, you know, called me during the process. Um, she had gone in for the interview and of course I prepped her and I told her to ask the, Oh, ask the closing question. Is there any concern or reason to, you know, that you have about my candidacy for this position or any reason to believe I wouldn't make an excellent candidate for this position or an excellent team member or whatever. I tell people, you know, do something that works for you. And she asked the question, she interviewed with six people, the six, everybody, first five people said, no, we think you'd make a great addition to our team. The sixth person said, yes, I do have a concern. And I'm not going to go through all that. It's in the book, but she told her what the concern was. And this woman addressed the concern and she got the job offer. Right. Mm -hmm. So then she's negotiating and she calls me one night and she says, I want to talk to you about negotiating. So I, I went through and I talked to him and, and she said, there are three things I want to ask about that I'm, you know, and she says, I want more money than what they're offering. And I said, okay, um, didn't ask her how much or whether, you know, I said, did you do your homework? Is it reasonable? You know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I have. And you think it's reasonable for what? And she goes, yes, I do. And I said, well, then ask for it, right? And she said, I'd like more vacate, another week of vacation, blah, blah, blah. And I said, ask for it. And then she said, <clears throat> it was a, also a young company and they wanted to give her the title project manager. And the last two companies she worked for, her title was senior project manager. And she said, Carrie, if I take a title of project manager on my resume in the future, it's going to look like I, you step know, down. step down. And it's not a step down, but um, well, see, part of the reason why they're concerned for hiring was that the job description asked for someone with a master's or PhD. 
And she didn't have either. In fact, she called me about that one and she goes, I really want this job, but I don't meet the basic criteria. And, I, and she told me what it was. And, I'm, you know, she has a bachelor's degree in art history, you know, but she's been in the pharmaceutical industry for 15 years. She's got her PMP certificational and she's worked, you know, and, and I said, well, you know what? I said, even though you don't meet it, I said, I would go ahead and still send in the resume because you never know. If you don't send it in, you'll never know, right? Right. So send it in. And if they don't, if they screen you out, then you understand why. Okay. So when she got to that sixth woman, she said, you know, I, my concern is you don't have a master's or PhD. And her, her answer to that was, that's true. I don't have a master's or PhD, but I have worked with almost everybody on my project teams for the last, you know, 10, 15 years have because most of the people in the pharmaceutical industry, many of them have master's and PhDs, the majority of them do. And she said, a lot of my people, my teams have those advanced degrees. And I have been very successful in developing high performing teams. And I've never had an issue with anyone, you know, based on the fact that I didn't have, and the, you know, and that satisfied, that enough, right. right. Okay. But when, but when she asked about the job title and she said, Carrie, I really would like to ask for a senior project manager. I said, her, her name was Elizabeth. I said, Elizabeth, I said, that should be an easy one for them because if they wanted you to have a master's or PhD by giving you a senior project management title, it elevates you more in the eyes of others. So that should be an easy thing for them to do. It's just a job title. Right. And, and that should help alleviate some of their concerns that you don't yet you don't have the degree i think that's an easy that's a win-win for both of you so and, it, and what's so funny though is again her husband's in the background and i could hear him he's going elizabeth don't do it don't do it you know so like fred sanford right, right. Um, you know he says elizabeth don't do it and they'll pull the job offer i could hear him saying that and i and i i said elizabeth turn around tell your husband i said be quiet <laughs> shut up whatever but don't listen to him i said listen, all she can say is no, but she's not going to pull the job offer. And here's what that right. woman said. The HR manager, when they said, I'm concerned, they'll pull the job offer. She said, again, I've only pulled it in two years, but here's the reason why she doesn't pull the job offer. She said, by the time I get you there at that point where we're negotiating salary, I have already invested so much time in you. Right. I am not going to pull the job offer from, from you. Sorry. I am not going to pull the job offer from you just because you asked for an extra week of vacation or a little, you know, a job title or something like that. As long as what you're asking is reasonable, mm -hmm. I will consider it. Makes sense. And so I just want people to know that, you know, if you're not negotiating, you're leaving stuff on the table. You've just got to make sure that what you're asking is, is reasonable, but based on your experience, based on your knowledge, based on your, you know, those types of things. And as long as you do, again, I can't promise you're going to get all of it, but, you know, and I have another friend who's an HR manager and she said to me, I, I told her the story, what had happened in that um, training session. She said to me, um, she doesn't work there anymore, but she used to be the HR manager for Revlon and um, locally about, and she said, Carrie, if I interview someone and they don't negotiate at all for me, she goes, I don't really respect them. She goes, wow. I, you know, I expect people to, you know, value themselves enough to ask for something. So, I mean, again, it's a different attitude, but that was her. She goes, I like people that ask for stuff because I, I feel like, you know, it's, it says a little bit about them as an employee too. Sure. I mean, think about the job, you know, if you're a project manager, you got to negotiate all the time, every day for something. That's right. So if they're not negotiating for themselves in this situation, then what kind of negotiator are they? Yeah. What kind yeah. of, you know, so if you're in sales or project manager or whatever you're in and negotiating is part of what we do in business. Um, and a lot of people don't think they negotiate, but everybody negotiates on a daily basis when you're asking for more time more resources, you know, your kids negotiate with you. And I'm people say, well, Constantly. I negotiate with my kids, I said, yeah, well, they negotiate with you when they ask you if they can stay yeah, up sometimes later. It's like hostage negotiations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Interesting. Interesting. So, um, I do have a question. Um, do you, I mean, I know your your focus is is careers and jobs and things like that. But do you think that the 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 result of somebody's Myers Briggs inventory says anything about romantic matches? You know, mm -hmm. like okay, let me tell you something about the romantic piece of it. The statistics show the, the, when they've collected, you know, your stuff, your information, statistics show that opposites attract. Okay. So I know that you said you and your husband are, are very close, except he's an I and you're an E or something like that. Yeah. In your case, it may be a little bit different, but initially, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, and I run into all the time in my class when people say, oh, my wife and I, or my husband and I, we're complete opposite. 
opposites attract. And you know why they attract is because, and I remember a couple of my church years ago, and they dated five years and then they got engaged to get married. And then, um, well, it didn't end up working out, but what initially attracted, I know Ron to, to this other late, to my friend was he was, he was so Jay, so structured, wanted everything done. So like this, that she's, she's a very P personality and very go with the flow and kind of fun. And you know, this, and I'm not saying he wasn't fun, but she was more relaxed and everything. And I think that's what he was attracted to. Okay. Right. So they brought out the best in each other. So, so they did, but when they, before they got married, before they didn't end up getting married, but they, they moved in together and they found out that what initially he kept trying to change her, what he liked about her before now that they were living together. No, she had to do this this way. And she, he was basically, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this. And he was trying to tell her everything to do it the way he would do it. Right. Right. And see what happens in relationships. And this is why it's important, whether you've attracted somebody that's opposite of you or even somebody similar, but if you attract somebody opposite, that may be great in the beginning, but what's going to happen ultimately is you're going to, somebody's going to be trying to change the other one. And it's going to end up in a lot of conflict. And so if you go through the Myers-Briggs and this is why it's so helpful, whether it's through your church or through, you know, marriage counselor or through, you know, whatever, the more you understand about your partner and understand that they may be very different than you, but you trying to force them to be like you is not going to enhance your relationship. No. With it, and it's, and it's, and that's why a lot of people just like with the five love languages, when you don't speak the other person's love language, you end up ultimately, you know, you loved each other at one time and then now you hate each other and you're already, you know, and you end up getting a divorce. But if you would start off earlier learning about the other person, whether it's through Myers-Briggs or, you know, the you five can make a much more informed decision. Absolutely. And you want to treat the other person with the way they want to be treated versus the way you think it should be done. Right. Makes sense. Makes sense. So good question. Yes. Yes. We learned a ton. So, so can we finish this, the, the six quick questions now that they're not, (laughs) Yes. Yes, (laughs) I can't believe I did that, but let's finish them. Why not? So let's go to question number two. What's your favorite way to spend a day? Honestly, my favorite way to spend the day, and um, and it could be, it include people too, but I love my dogs and mm-hmm. I've got two goldens and a beagle and a cat and a foster dog right now. But um, if I can do stuff with, with them, take them on a walk, go for a hike, take them swimming. Um, last night I took um, Keegan, my two-year-old golden to um, the Durham Bulls baseball game. It's like a semi-pro team in, in this area. And um it was actually, I was volunteering with Noose River Golden Retriever Rescue because we had a tent there, but he's an extrovert and I'm an extrovert. I mean, I the have dog a dog is an extrovert. Oh, oh yes. I mean, my God, <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. Some dogs are shy and they want to, you know, Yeah, absolutely. Dog, he goes there. He, he's pulling me to be, and he, oh, he comes up to somebody he's, his whole rear end is wagging. And I mean, and he cuddles up and, you know, I mean, he just wants to see everybody. I mean, he's right. so extroverted. And um, so I just love spending time with my dogs. And here's what's really cool about that too, as an extrovert myself, and, and just relating to people. You know, there's a lot of people that you could walk around and, you know, people, they look down, they don't look at you, they don't give you eye contact. But when you have a dog, especially a cute dog, like my, my two-year-old golden, who's just perfectly handsome, he's so, such a sweetie. Um, people, strangers, perfect strangers talk, talk to you and you end up having yeah, great yeah. conversations and meeting really interesting people because of my dog. So mm-hmm. I just love to, you know, sometimes it's just spending the day at home and reading a book, but it's kind of nice having come, you know, having them laying there near me and, and just knowing that they always love me unconditionally. They never judge me. No, <laughs> so definitely not. I love spending time with them and people too, but yes, makes sense. Uh, what's your favorite childhood memory? You know, I had, I thought about that. I have uh, several, but you know, I know you're from Long Island and my favorite childhood memories were going up to New York to visit my relatives and my mother's sister and my grandmother and and then my, my aunt and uncle and their five kids lived in Setauk at Stony Brook area. That's not so far from me. They lived in this huge house. You couldn't see, I mean, there was no neighbors around where they, I don't know how many acres they had, but it's a big English Tudor house. And we used to have so much fun there and they had horses and, and it was just, and they lived near Jones beach and it was just so much fun. Um, But my other relatives, my dad's side, they lived in Staten Island um, houses much closer together and all, but I just, 
I loved going over there and visiting his family and two of his sisters lived there and his mother, my grandmother. And we used to go to my aunt Charlotte and uncle Charlie's house. And this is probably my favorite. I mean, I love both sides of the family, but we'd go to aunt Charlotte, uncle Charlie's house. And she'd always cook a big spot of, pot of spaghetti with meatballs. And then sometime during the night, there was always dancing and it was line nice. dance. We were, and you'll get this. We were doing things like the, the bunny hop mm -hmm. and the, what's the other one, the hokey pokey mm -hmm. and, you know, all those types of things. I mean, I don't know if anybody does those anymore, even I uh, did with but, my kids, but I don't yeah. know. But it was just, we always just had so much fun together and I miss those days. I mean, I really miss that. It was just, it was just simple things, yeah. you know, spending time with them. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, number four, what's your favorite meal? If someone were to say to me, you got one last meal here to eat. I thought about it because I like a lot of different things. And, uh, but I love every time I go to Atlanta to teach or, or whatever, if I'm in the West Paces Ferry area, close to where I used to live, I love to go to this place called the OK Cafe. And I love their pot roast and mashed potatoes. Nice. And it comes with a side of vegetables. I love vegetables too, but just it's comfort food, you sure. know, and my mom used to make that sometimes, but I, I don't miss too many chances when I'm Atlanta to go by the okay cafe and get that pot roast and mashed potatoes and they make the best down there. So well, that's wonderful. Um, okay. Now here's number five, the question that you liked before, what one piece of advice would you like to give a younger self? You said to get coaching get coaching, spend the money, you know, and for parents, I mean, I had someone recently who wanted me to help her daughter with a question on a job interview and like that. But, her, you know, honestly, her daughter needs a whole lot more coaching than that. And she wasn't willing to invest more than, you know, one session, which is kind of sad because, you know, her daughter's graduated from college, but now she's kind of stuck and she doesn't know what to do and where to go. And, you know, it's like, I think, gee, you know, your parents spend thousands and thousands, or maybe you have to pay it back later, tens and tens of thousands of dollars on a, on a college education. But, you know, for a couple of career sessions that will really help you gain movement, it is so worth it. And it's going to help you so much, but so many people don't want to spend a couple hundred dollars, a thousand dollars or whatever for that additional thing to really help. And it's just, I think it's important that parents think about that and high yeah. schools, you know, you work in a high school, you know, that, I mean, they have limited resources and they're not going to do that type of stuff. I mean, I know you do a little bit with your students and you do that on your own, but um, it, it's just something that parents should invest in for their, for their kids, whether it's before college or after college. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's invaluably important. Uh, let's get to question six. What is one thing you most would like to change about the world? Well, it's one thing I wish I could change and I doubt that it will ever change, but you know, I, because of my project management training, I've had the opportunity to travel to 22 different countries around the world. And I know to some people, that's not a lot for other people. It's a lot. That's a lot um, for me. I haven't been to know, that many places. I mean, I've been to, you know, Brazil, South America, Central America. I've been all over Europe, um, from Canada, from the East Coast to the West Coast, from, you know, St. John's Island to, to Victoria Island. Um, you know, I've been to Turkey, one of my favorite places. I love my trip to Turkey. I've been to um, Indonesia and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia and places like that. And here's what I know. I know that people are all inside. We're all basically the same. We have dreams, we have desires. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we all have basic human needs. And I, and I teach that overseas sometimes and they'll go, is that just an American thing? And I'm like, no, no, no. These are basic human needs, the need to, for safety and security and mm -hmm. membership and affiliation and self-esteem and self-actualization, you know, and obviously at the bottom of that is the physiological need for food and water and oxygen, you know, the basic things. And so we're more alike than we are different. But yet we focus on those differences. So I wish that people would could see that. And that's what I love about, you know, being able to travel. And I encourage people, if you get an opportunity to travel somewhere, go there and you're going to see that people are not that different, no matter what you hear about them and their culture. If you don't, you go and experience and you'll see that. And then on the other, the flip side of that is that we should learn to embrace the diversity. I mean, I also love it when I see these different cultures and the food that they eat and their and sure. the things that they do and 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 their practices and and things like that. But you know, I've never gone any place where I felt unwelcome mm -hmm. as you know, as a person, as an American. I've all because I've always treated people with kindness. 
and I'm open to their culture. I'm open to the, the diversity. I mean, I'm, I'll tell you something else about intuitives. And since you're an intuitive, you might find this interesting. Intuitives love variety. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, variety is a spice of life, you know, and I love that, that we're different as people, but I also know in inside, we're all, we all have a lot alike, you know, there's a we're sameness more alike than we are different. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's a sameness about us, but we also need to learn to embrace that diversity and know that we're stronger if we can do that. And we just love and accept people where they are. If I could change the world, that's what I'd love to do. Um, you know, probably not going to happen in my lifetime, but that, but you know, every time, you know, but every time I go overseas and I will tell you, I can change it a little bit. And, and that's not true because my parents for years had foreign students come and live with them because we lived on a farm my last four years in high school and he had FFA programs um, where they brought foreign students in and they would live on the farm with my parents and my both my mother and father are deceased now but for years those students when they left they kept in touch with my parents and they got a different view of what America was really like and I remember and this was uh, when I was in Poland one time teaching and we went out to dinner after class one night and, and one of my, no, no, I wasn't in Poland. I was in Rome, Italy. And um, I had a, a Polish guy and there was a guy from um, Latvia, I think it was, or something. I can't remember where he was from, but anyways, but it was so interesting because we go to dinner at night and, and one of them says, you know, you're, you're not, um, you're not like a typical American. I said, really what's a typical American like because I always love to ask sure. that question and see what they think of a typical American so they kind of you know told me a few things and and I said well where do you get your idea of a typical American oh well we get to, we watch uh, you know everybody loves Raymond we watch American TV program yeah. right and I said okay so what what we had three right I said what what three programs do you get now this is a number of years ago but even then these shows we got um I guess it was two programs Roseanne and married with children. Okay. Right. And that's where they had their image of what a typical American was like. Okay. And so, so I can make a difference in the fact that when I go somewhere and any American make this difference, when you go somewhere and you travel overseas or whether you welcome other people into your home. And I've done that here in Raleigh with the, the International Visitors Culture uh, Council, where I've had people come to my home for dinner and I've worked with them and, and, is, you know, let them know that, you know, to get to know you as a person versus this, you know, who they think Americans are or who we think, you know, Iraqis are or Iranians are or, or, you know, whoever, um, understand that that's just, that's media. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not who they are. And if we no. can learn that about people, we can learn to love other people and other cultures. It's a beautiful answer, Carrie. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's, we have to get past all of these divisive characteristics that the media keeps feeding us. Yeah. Because that sells airtime and sells advertising and gets eyes on the show and, and so on. But it really doesn't, it doesn't match with what's actually going on. It doesn't portray the, the, who those people really are, nor does it when people see about Americans, they're like, you know, doesn't really portray who we are either, you know, and I, and I have, I remember I was on a trip in Germany one time and, and there was this guy on the trip. I didn't know him. It was a, a group trip and we were sitting in, in the Hofbau house or something like that, someplace in, in uh, Munich, Germany. And, and the people came over and said something and, and he was a much older gentleman at the time. And he was just this belligerent American attitude. And he said, and he said really loud, why don't they learn to speak English, the damn krauts? And he said that <gasps> loud. And the rest of us at this table were like, and I mean, again, I didn't know this guy personally. I just knew, and, and I was just like, oh my God. And I'm thinking, this is the ugly American that they talk about. Right. I mean, this is the type of person that makes other people, they, they all I have to see is one person that acts that way, one person that speaks that way, and then and then other people can validate. Oh yeah, that's that's those Americans. You know, mm -hmm. they're loud, they're obnoxious, they're you know whatever. And that's not who we are. You know, I mean, yeah, I know a few people like that, but not as a culture as a whole. That's not who we are. So, no. so we can all make a difference, even though I can't change it. Everybody, well, you can in your own sphere. You can difference. by your own interpersonal relationships with people who you meet and you know, give them 
a one-on-one -on -one different perspective. And it's really all we can, any of us can do. But if we all do that, then, you know, then we'll make some inroads. And, you know, and because I, I teach in corporate America, and I'm not talking my international class, but in corporate America and in the government classes, I remember saying one time about negotiating uh, international type things. And I said, oh, that's right. You're not, because most of the government things are not. And someone put up their hand and said, have you looked around this classroom? And y'all got to do is look around a classroom and you see, you know, you've got people from India, you got people from sure. China, you've got people from Korea, you've got people from Mexico, you've got, you know, we, we have, you know, and, and Very they have standard as to live, you know, we, we still have people here, even if you're not traveling to another country who see that perception mm -hmm. and, and so much in my corporate classes are, are highly integrated with so many different cultures. So, yeah. My classroom is much more integrated every year. It gets more and more and more, you know, lots of different ethnicities and languages and customs and religions and skin colors. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And opportunities all around us, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this was heavenly wonderful, Carrie. Thank you so much for doing this and for being on Permission to Heal and explaining, explaining everything that you explained so well. I, I think we all got a lot out of it. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And, and, um, you know, it really does align with what you're talking about there and helping people heal. So as we hold on, I'm gonna have to put this on silent mode. It's the same got crickets <laughs> calling me back. Yes. It's a very good friend of mine. And, uh, but I hung up on her the last <laughs> minute ago, so I'll All call right. her back as soon as I get off. But Marcy, thank you so much for having me. Thank you it's so been much. a pleasure to be here with you and your audience today. Thank you. Do you like a personal breeze? People are always coming up to me when I have my cell phone fan on and I have this lovely little breeze, keeps my face cool, helps combat hot flashes, um, makes very little noise, and I have my own little personal breeze. I get these fans, tiny little fans, they don't weigh anything. They uh, come in multiple colors each one, so you can see each one has dual connectors. So you have for an Android phone, and if that's what you have, then you can cut this piece off. But if you have a, an Apple phone, it has a little connector, it snaps into the bottom of your phone, and voila, it does not eat up a lot of the battery juice, um, but it keeps you cool. These fans save my life. I hot flash all the time and it's just enough to keep the cool air moving around my face and circumvents the hot flash so I don't get drenched. Uh, I, I cannot recommend these little fans enough. They are amazing. Total time savers. No, these fans are total makeup savers. They're face savers. They're hairdo savers. You know, I sweat under my bangs and then everything gets soaking wet. These fans are amazing. I buy them on Amazon. You get like five or six to a bundle and, um, and they're inexpensive ways to keep yourself cool. And when you're wearing a mask, it keeps the air around the mask and in the mask a little cooler. So you're not as hot and claustrophobic and so on. Um, so tap on the link below. It'll take you right to Amazon. You can pick up a set yourself. Stay cool, everyone.
Thank you for joining me for this episode of Permission to Heal. I hope you found it moving and inspirational. Please remember, you don't need anyone else's permission to trust and follow your heart. You have the power within you. Subscribe to Permission to Heal so you don't miss any new episodes, and please share this with your friends.